Okay, welcome back, everybody. We're ready to start our next session. Our next session will be on uncovering and discovering new vistas in neural integration. Our first speaker is Vivek Jayaraman from Janilia Research Campus. All right, can you hear me back there? Yes. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. This is always a pleasure to come to Cosine and to represent the invertebrate side of Cosine is particularly enjoyable. Tends to be very mammalian decision-making focused. I'm not sure why. Uh, no, so uh, today I'm gonna tell you about the fly and I'm gonna focus in particular on what we think is kind of really cool about the fly, which is the potential for mechanistic access. So, you know, what do I mean by mechanism? I mean things that get you to implementation level answers for how computations are performed. And what, is it, what do I mean by implementation? I think we can go down to synaptic cellular circuit levels of explanation. And so one thing that's kind of handy when you're doing these kinds of things is a connectome, something the worm folks know all about. It's relatively recent in the fly. I just wanna run you through a little video. It's gonna go by very quickly. Ask me later if you want me to slow it down and show you. Um, but it's a collaboration between Google and Genelia lab heads and the fly EM team at Genelia. And so what uh, the project involves is taking a significant chunk of real estate in the fly brain, slicing it up, um, and then using FibSEM, so focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy, to basically take these images, stitching them together with machine learning, and then getting an isotropic volume where you can actually go in and identify synapses very, very accurately. So this is done automatically, but needs manual proofreading, but it's kind of stunning how an isotropic volume gives you pretty much um, you know, a lot of the synapses that are in that brain. So, the image segmentation comes courtesy of Google with their flood filling deep recurrent nets. Um, again, it's very, very good, but not perfect. So Viren Jain's team there have gotten it down to science at this point. Uh, well, I guess it was always a science, but. Um, and so, you know, after this, there, are, there is an element of proofreading that humans need to go in and kind of clean up. But at the end, you get gorgeous images like this. These are, of course, the best neurons in the fly brain. These are called ring neurons. The fact that I happen to work on them has nothing to do with anything. Um, so the question is, so you have you know, these kinds of tools, it's, it's very exciting. Um, what, what do you do with them? Well, it's not just EM. In the fly, you have something more. You can go in and say, well, give me that neuron that you just traced, um, not the previous one, but a different one, in light as well. Give me a genetically targeted set of lines uh, that allow me to go figure out where that neuron is put whatever kind of sensor I want in it, whether it's, um, maybe it's just a fluorescent marker like GFP, maybe it's GCAMP uh, to mark it with uh, calcium indicators, maybe it's an optogenetic activator, an inhibitor, and the fact that you have a catalog of these kinds of lines that target specific cell types in entirety is super powerful. But again, the question is, what do you do with it all? I mean, you have all these tools, what can you do in Drosophila? And so I think, Many people, I wouldn't say at cosine, of course. I mean, I'm sure no one who works on humans or primates here thinks the fly is you know, just a reflex machine. Uh, I'm, I'm sure no one thinks that. But, but just in case someone does, um, I, I'd like to point out, I mean, firstly, reflexes. I mean, Tiago sort of showed how sophisticated something like an escape response can be. And Gwyneth Card at Genelia has kind of shown that too. Um, there are very interesting things you can learn in things that look like straight up sensory motor transforms. They can seem boring. So for example, if you give a fly an arena with two very prominent landmarks, like two vertical stripes, the fly will just kind of go, you know, pacing its cage, like back and forth, back and forth uh, for a long time. And so it seems like, ah, you know, what is that? It's just attracted, fixates on a stripe. Um, not, not unlike someone on a treadmill perhaps, but still, you know, you'd say that that's, that's not very exciting. Uh, there's other behaviors that are really interesting, which is large field motion causes a fly to kind of follow along. So if the world moves one way or the other, the fly on the ball is gonna track that world, an optomotor response. Getting to the bottom of that, all the way down to a mechanism is something, I mean, all the way down to the whole pathway is something that's possible in the fly. Uh, but again, you could say this is a direct response to a sensory input. Does the fly do more than that? And so, one thing to remember is that while the fly brain is dominated by pathways that go from visual to motor fairly quickly, and one of the remarkable things about it is how quickly the fly does respond to visual input, um, those are not the only pathways. So these are the sort of pathways that have been most studied in the fly brain. Several posters here deal with elements of these pathways. These go from the visual system, 
the visual input comes in there, pretty directly, a few synapses later to the motor system, to the legs and the wings and so on. But there are other pathways in the fly brain that actually stop over, these are indirect pathways, into, for example, recurrent circuitry, and I'm particularly keen on one particular pathway. And in the recurrent circuits that, that are in there, they bounce around for a while before they go make their way down to the motor areas. And so the particular kind of recurrent circuit that we study in my lab is called the central complex. It consists of a bunch of different neuropils that I'll get into very shortly. But the question is, you know, what does this kind of thing buy a fly? Why do you have recurrent circuits like that? I mean, what kind of information would the fly need to keep around um, more than just instantaneous responses to stimuli? And so it's important to remember there are other things that fly, flies do. So, you know, it's not just about fixating on stripes. Um, this is an example which I really like from Michael Dickinson's lab, a relatively recent example, where you put a fly in an arena, as they did, the fly kind of wanders around, seems to be exploring the arena, lots of straight paths, but also some curvy ones. But this is before food is introduced into the arena. If you introduce food in the arena, like so, um, what happens after the food is gone is that the fly kind of makes these little circular paths. So the fly is no longer just sort of sitting where the food is or just going to a landmark. It's kind of exploring around that, and if the food is nutritious, it can maybe make smaller paths first before it makes longer ones. So there's an, a need for a fly, just like any other organism, to explore. And so one thing that you might wonder is, is this just like, you know, the fly is kind of going around and it looks maybe disoriented? Is it just like Jonathan Pillow and Michael Long after a night in a karaoke bar? It's not. So you can, as Michael Dickinson looked closely, and Irene Kim in his lab looked closely at the trajectories of the fly, and it actually looks like they're path integrating. So they keep track of distance, so they're, you know, walking along, they don't have their eyes shut, I do. They're turning around, they're making their way back, and you know, they get pretty close before they fall off the stage. So, you know, this is something which requires internal computations to keep track of your own movements, incorporate them in where you're going. This works in the dark as well. It's important to uh, state in this same paper, they've shown that too, in the absence of olfactory cues and so on. So all of this is just to say the fly needs potentially to keep an internal representation of where it is to perform things like this, which you could say is sort of dead reckoning in a sense, right? But beyond that, flies also display flexibility. And in this beautiful assay that came through Michael Reiser's lab, um, it's kind of modeled on the Morris water maze, except um, you have a cool spot here instead of a platform uh, that's immersed in water. The, the water experiments didn't work so well for the fly. Um, so then, w w the school spot is essentially the only safe spot in an environment that's rather hot around. And the question is, if there are visual cues around, well, will the fly just display its standard stripe fixation thing and go sit at a stripe? Or will it learn over time that a particular spot in this environment represents safety from the, from, from the heat? And if the spot moves, will the fly find its way to that spot, the cool spot, faster and faster? And so this is what um, Tyler Ofstad, the grad student in Michael's lab and, and Charles Zucker's lab did. A bunch of flies is a sped up video. And so of course, eventually the flies find their way there after kind of stumbling through there at first. But the spot shifts to a new place. This visual cues shift with it. And at this point, the flies don't leave the spot if they find it, except for you know some moron flies maybe. <laughs> and then if the spot shifts again, you'll notice some of them are making a straight line, a fly line to, to, that, to that particular spot. So what this particular behavior entails is you know, learning an association between a visual environment and you know, safety or, or punishment and so on and so forth. And clearly this, the fly has the capacity to do that. Nobody's saying they have a cognitive map, not yet, um, but, but they clearly do have the capacity to encode visual motor associations, visual thermal associations like this. So the key region that seems to be involved in doing this is that region I showed you earlier, the recurrent circuitry-based region I talked about, the central complex. And this is indeed the region that, that we've been studying for the last little bit. Um, you know, it won't surprise you if you're studying a region that has a very strong behavioral role, the ideal way to study it is to study it in animals that are actually behaving. And so we've come up with uh, setups that seem very low res on the screen somehow, um, that allow us to do two-photon imaging and electrophysiology from flies that are tethered and either flying, meaning flapping their wings, um, or walking on a little ball, kind of like you saw in the earlier video from Michael Reiser's lab. And so um, in both these cases, we can feed back the motion that we detect of the ball or the wings 
uh, we can feed that back, the signal back, into the visual display to put the fly in closed loop, and so it can navigate a virtual reality environment or just you know, control the position of, say, a stripe or a simple angular rotation of the world. The key thing, though, is that we can do that uh, while imaging from entire populations of a particular cell type. So I don't mean like 1% or 2%, I mean 100% of a particular cell type. So you get a very clear picture of what the entire population is actually doing, which contributes quite a bit to how much we can extract from it. In addition, we can do whole cell patch clamp recordings from targeted neurons, and that obviously gives you greater resolution, uh, which is very handy as well. So one particular use I'm gonna quickly focus on is, you know, I started with those visual pathways. What are those visual pathways? I mean, what information gets into the central complex? Um, this is work that Johannes did a long time ago, in, uh, you know, a few years ago, but recently we've kind of refined with uh, Yi and Anne. Yi is part of the Genie team at Genelia. Uh, and Anne is a theorist who you, some of you have probably met in, uh, at, at Cosine. And so what we discovered is basically that if you throw the fly, uh, if you throw visual stimuli at the fly, white noise stimuli, multiple stripes, et cetera, et cetera, you get back receptive fields that kind of remind you of simple cells in some ways, but different in the sense that they have ipsilateral feature detector properties, as well as contralateral inhibition, and there's a spatial and a temporal component uh, to both these properties, okay? So visual information comes in, feature information, maybe some uh, stimulus selection going on because of the contralateral inhibition, and then all that information feeds into the uh, middle of the central complex. So what happens if you cut that information off? And so this is an experiment we can do. We can perturb the system with a thermogenetic tool called Shibiri, literally take those inputs coming in from one of these things to the next, the bulb, um, cut them off and ask what happens. And so what happens if it loses the feature information? Well, a normal fly, um, you know, as I showed you with those many behaviors, it doesn't always just lock onto a stripe and go straight for it. It picks different headings. If the stripe is, represents a stripe, I mean, if this represents a stripe right in front over there, um, you know, the blue line that you see, the blue arrow, represents maybe walking towards the stripe. In these three cases, not so much in that. If we jump the stripe artificially, um, the fly sometimes will fixate on it in front, sometimes on the side, sometimes behind. And we've done this for a few more flies now. But what happens when you switch off this pathway, when you take the central complex visual input, this particular visual input out, is that the fly tends to fixate the stripe reliably in front. And so we've done these, the controls for these, but essentially it turns out that the fly will basically keep the fly in uh, the stripe in front. So the kind of picture that I'm trying to paint here is it's not that the fly doesn't have strong reflexive movements towards visual landmarks, towards stripes. It's just that there's this indirect pathway where other things happen, where maybe the flies need to explore, and so you can't just fixate on the first thing you see. You kind of have to keep it on the side, uh, meander your way to somewhere. And we think that switching off this pathway into the central complex essentially reduces some of the visual behaviors into a more locked-in mode. This is not a new idea. The fact that the central complex might be involved in navigation is kind of old. Um, people have been talking about it since Uwe Holmberg was doing experiments in Locus, and also experiments in the fly that I haven't talked about from other labs. Um, and then there's interesting experiments in the dung beetle uh, that, that you know, use the sky compass to navigate. There's experiments um, in monarch butterflies that actually navigate over thousands of kilometers, and again, the central complex is thought to be key for that. So, you know, and then there's the cockroach as well. So there's many insects that all share this one structure called the central complex, and, and they all seem, I mean, all the results suggest it's key for navigation of different sorts. So our own goal has been to try and understand the mechanisms underlying some of these properties, behavioral properties that you might think the central complex is involved in. And so we focused first on the structure called the ellipsoid body, the structure where all those inputs were coming in, the feature detector kind of inputs were coming in. And what we were first interested in doing uh, was analyzing these neurons that receive that input. Um, these are called compass neurons for reasons that will become very clear shortly. We call them compass neurons, rather. Um, and so these neurons basically arborize in this toroidal structure called the ellipsoid body. It's as if each neuron has a slice of that pie. These are largely dendrites of that neuron. And what you get with these neurons um, is kind of a representation of where the fly is pointed, so the orientation of the fly. And we know that through experiments Johannes Selig did. Um, so Johannes did these experiments where he put GCAMP6F, a calcium indicator, in just this one population. So the entire population is labeled. Um, the fly is walking on a ball. The movements of the ball, again, are fed back into the visual display. I'm showing it to you flattened, but you should imagine this around the fly. And what you're gonna see is 
um, this little bump of activity that forms that seems to track the fly's orientation in this world. So some of you have probably seen this before, but I'm just gonna play it for a little bit so that you get convinced that it is doing a rather decent job of tracking um, the orientation of the fly. So again, this is calcium transients inside the ellipsoid body in a specific subpopulation of neurons called, the, we call them compass neurons. And so it won't surprise you that if you take those uh, activity patterns and you slice up this pie according to what we think is the division of these different neurons, this image is a multicolor flip out image, so it's like a stochastically labeled brain with all these neurons kind of being different neurons. We kind of know they slice up the structure in something close to this fashion, so we can compute a population vector average and get back a, an estimate, a population vector estimate of what the orientation of the fly is. So having watched that video, it won't surprise you that it actually tracks the angular actual panorama position rather well. Now, an obvious question from this is, you know, is it really the visual stuff that's doing this or is it just tracking self-motion? I mean, because they're coupled. And so we've done experiments where we alter the gain and verify that if there's a prominent visual cue or a prominent visual scene that the fly has to look at, the fly is gonna use that visual scene and it locks onto that and not to its self-motion. However, if you deprive the fly of that visual input, you put it in darkness, you paint its eyes blacks and black, and this is what Johannes did, this representation actually doesn't go anywhere, it kind of hangs around. So um, you'll see that here. So the fly is walking on the ball. And so the fly can use self-motion information to keep track of where it is, is how we uh, interpret this. Perhaps also interestingly, this representation doesn't go away when the fly is standing still. So the fly is just kind of hanging out here, chilling, grooming, um, and then you'll see for a while it's just sitting there. This can go on 30 seconds longer. I mean, we just happen to have left the fly. I mean, we, uh, the fly sits for as long as it wants. And what we see in all the quantification, you can go to the paper, it's there, but for 30, 35 seconds that the fly just happened to be sitting in one place, the representation persists. And even if it appears to go away from the point of view of a calcium indicator, we notice that it restarts in the exact place that it should, or close to the exact place that it should when the fly resumes walking. So it's there in the circuit, um, even if it doesn't seem to be to us with GCAM. So obviously these are things that seem to relate quite a bit to you know, how a fly might kind of keep its orientation, keep its bearings in darkness, at least components of this. I haven't shown you anything to show, suggest that it can measure distance. Um, those are the kinds of things that we're working on now, but at least in terms of angles and being able to integrate over those, we think one solution could be these kinds of neurons, okay? So to summarize this part so far, we have this um, wonderful ellipsoid body, which actually is, is very, very uh, kind of you know, evocative of a particular kind of structure that several people here know about. There's a single bump of activity, which is an abstract representation of the fly's orientation. Um, the activity is constrained to move in this ring. Drift tends to be in that ring in, in kind of sequential fashion and the representation persists even without visual cues and in the absence of self-motion. So obviously this is very familiar to some of you as a, a kind of thing that you'd think, well, ring attractors, right? I mean, this is something that um, people have studied for a while in, in theory, um, and it's been harder to get traction on it in terms of actual experiments. Now, of course, all of that work has been inspired by a huge body of work from Jeff Tobey and others um, in the head direction system in rodents. The one issue with that is that it's really challenging to test the models because the models invariably make a lot of statements about how closely and how strongly particular neurons need to be connected to other neurons which have similar or different tuning from them in terms of head direction. And so in this kind of model, you might say, well, maybe the nearby neurons should be strongly connected, uh, excitatorily maybe even connected, and maybe the ones with opposite head direction tuning need to be inhibited. Now, of course, this is just a schematized theoretician's idealization of the network. The question is, does the fly literally have something like this because it's the theorist's dream? So, you know, that's the question I'll try and unfold. Um, all right, we have music back up now. Uh, so, um, so the kind of question that we explore in the fly is, is basically using, relies heavily on the fact that the compass network in the fly actually has, is strongly topographic. So it's, topologically, topographically kind of really nice to have head direction basically match where your uh, neurons are spatially located or the dendrites of the neurons are spatially located. 
The fact that we can monitor the entire population allows us to see this bump move around the whole ring. That's kind of convenient to have. And I'll show you, we can selectively perturb the activity of specific neurons, meaning specific neurons tuned in particular ways. And finally, I already started the talk with this, but I'll get back to it near the end. We have access to connectivity, really uh, fine level connectivity. So the first set of experiments I'm just gonna quickly run through are were performed by Sang Soo Kim in very close collaboration with theorists Hervé Ruo and uh, Shaul Druckmann. These were experiments where we were trying to say, well, you know, what are the basic assumptions that one makes when one says that something is a ring attractor? So one standard assumption might be that there has to be some sort of mutual inhibition so that the fly can have only one heading at a time. It doesn't simultaneously think it's going this way and that way. So mutual inhibition is kind of convenient to have. Is there this sort of suppression in the circuit? And so this is something that Sung Su tested where he had flies now in flight, I should have mentioned. The same kind of compass thing works in flight when there's a visual cue around. And what he did was have the fly in closed loop control of a stripe. The bump sort of forms here, you'll see. And then he's gonna optogenetically um, target this spot, activate neurons there using a particular kind of scanning um, method he worked on and do simultaneous two photon imaging with a higher intensity scan in this local area to create a new bump there. So there's CS crimson, an optogenetic activator in these neurons, as well as GCAMP. He's gonna activate just neurons in this area, and the question is, does the original bump go away when the new, new bump is created? And so you'll see the new old bump and the new bump, and the old one disappears almost instantaneously. Um, takes a few tens of milliseconds before we lose it. So there's the original bump. New bump is created when the uh, square goes red. And the new bump acts like the old bump in the sense that it persists and kind of wanders around and so on and so forth. So essentially, it's like altering the heading representation of the fly. And so Sung Su was able to do this systematically and show that until he got close to these um, neurons that he was stimulating, essentially, he could inhibit the bump no matter where it was originally, okay? So, this, of course, doesn't mean that the inhibition is, you know, is the inhibition uniform? Does it grade? Is it like a cosine tuning, like Heim and others have proposed for a ring attractor? And so this is something that we tested with a whole bunch of different experiments, but I'm just gonna show you one crisp one. Uh, this was, again, Sang Su's experiment where he created an optogenetic spot, so an optogenetic bump, and then he stimulated to see if he could make it go away either in, oh, I have to switch this, either in this spot or in that spot. And the question is, if this tuning is, is such that the inhibition is such that you know, maybe it's weaker here and stronger there, it should take more laser power to actually move the bump to here than to there, okay? So to shift it up should take greater laser power. What Sung Su found is that for, these, for this particular set, if he excites over there and creates an artificial bump and then competes that bump with these two positions, it's basically a flat line. So it looks like, at least to the extent of these experiments suggested, it looks like a uniform inhibition, right? Why would you have uniform inhibition and, and maybe local excitation? Yeah, I didn't show you the experiments for that. Well, I mean, we could speculatively say that it's maybe developmentally easier to wire up something to just be a uniform inhibition rather than having the graded inhibition, but you know, who knows, right? So our current model for how this little compass works, just in its basic elements, is that there's local excitation somehow and uniform inhibition throughout, and that gives you one bump in, in a particular, um, at a particular time point. How does the bump move around in darkness? That was the kind of next question we tackled. And here, it was kind of interesting because just like with the first set of experiments, anatomy really inspired us. And the anatomical, I don't know, the evidence from anatomy was so striking that it, it didn't just occur to us at the same time independently. Um, Gabby Mehman's lab, and Jonathan Green in particular in that lab, a grad student in the lab, also immediately latched on to this um, and found that there's a nice little trick the nervous system seems to be performing in order to move the bump in this um, little ellipsoid body structure. And so what was the trick that we all were so thrilled by? Um, well, the neurons I've been telling you about and calling compass neurons are actually EPG neurons. These are neurons that have their dendrites or largely dendrites in this structure, the ellipsoid body, each occupies one slice of this. The axons go up there to these structures, okay? And this is called the protocerebral bridge, but they go to just one column of these structures, all right? The key thing is there's another population of neurons, which we call PEN neurons. There's multiple types of these, one of which was discovered by Gabby's lab, but we've, we're gonna focus on a different type, on a specific uh, type that we think is involved in the particular operations I'm gonna tell you. 
And what Tanya Wolf in Jerry Rubin's lab at Janelia discovered is that they come back with an offset. So these are neurons now with their dendrites in the axonal arborizations of these guys. They come back, but they come back shifted one way. If you look at the other side, the EPG neurons seem to send their input to this column. You go to the exact same column, the PEN neurons come back with a shift in the other direction. So some of you are already thinking about, I mean, some of you know this, but some of you, those of you who don't, some of you have cottoned on to what might be happening here. If you have neurons that project back in a recurrent loop, but with a shift, and one shifts potentially one way and the other shifts the other way, well, you can think of how you might move a bump around. And so the model that it suggested to us was, well, if you have the EPG population targeting different little slices of the ellipsoid body, like so, I'm sorry for the graininess, I'm not sure why it's so grainy, uh, you have the PEN population with their dendrites in these same columns, but their axonal arbors to the sides. Well, in principle, and this is just a schematic, a conceptual model, uh, modeling, very similar to something that Skaggs and McNaughton proposed uh, in the 90s. Basically, if a bump forms here, the activity propagates up there, but now turn information selectively only goes to one side. Well, that side comes back, excites to the side of the original um, site of excitation, pulls the bump down one way, that sends the information back up, the bump kind of moves in two, it's like a windshield wiper in the protocerebral bridge. If the fly turns the other way, and if that excites selectively just this side of the protocerebral bridge, well, the information comes here. If it keeps turning, keeps exciting it, pulls the bump down this way, okay? So this is potentially a nice little mechanism that can allow you to move the bump one way or the other. Is it really there? And so this is something that we started by actually patching these neurons. So Stephanie Wiegner in the lab, um, she's kind of the gutsy, really excellent electrophysiologist, um, postdoc in the lab. She took on the challenge of patching these neurons uh, one by one, identifying that they were in fact PEN neurons and asking if indeed they have turn-specific responses. And so um, this was all done in a walking fly, either in darkness or in visual conditions. And what she found was that there was a turn specificity. So if you plotted them out, what she got was essentially a curve like this, tuning to angular velocity. If she patched from neurons on this side of the protocerebral bridge, the PEN neurons now from this side of the protocerebral bridge, she found that they would respond selectively to velo turn velocities in one direction. The other side, she'd get angular velocity tuning curves that responded selectively to the other direction. And so, of course, some of you might be wondering, um, what's the deal with these error bars? I mean, they are variability. What is this variability coming from? Now, for that, it's handy to remember there's another population of neurons that's feeding in input. It's not just turn information coming into these neurons. It's also heading information from the EPG, the compass neurons. So it, whatever is reflected here should be a combination of compass input and, in, in this model anyway, compass input and uh, turn velocity. And so when she plotted those two out, and looked for conjunctive coding, that is what she found. She found that these neurons are tuned heavily to angular velocity, yes, but also to heading. And so that's why you get, when you kind of project down, that's why you get these kinds of uh, curves, all right? So essentially, we have a key piece in place. We have um, angular velocity neurons that essentially encode both the heading and the angular velocity uh, of the fly, and they feed in nicely to neighboring columns of where the, the, where the bump originally is. So if the fly turns, in principle, it should be able to go one way or the other. We explored this um, with a theoretical model and, and a simulation approach as well. And so Hervé Ruo again, took the charge there. So what did he have in his model? He had EPG neurons. These are the compass neurons feeding up to these columns, the PEN neurons going back down and shifted to the side. Now, of course, it's a ring attractor model. We need one more component. So he stuck another component in there which was an inhibition that was broad and uniform like we um, think that it is in this circuit. So putting all these pieces together, what you end up with um, is a circuit where if you put in site-specific angular velocity on this side or on that side with the PENs on one side or the other, you can track pretty well um, the actual simulated population vector average actually matches quite well the heading of the animals. So this is enough with the right weights to actually get you there in terms of uh, a circuit that can do it. So it's a simple ring attractor with these two arms. So this kind of work actually made a prediction, right? I mean, this whole model makes a prediction that the PENs should essentially drag the EPG activity down one way or the other when the fly turns. Is that really the case? Do the PENs, in fact, lead the EPGs around the bump, I mean, around the uh, torus, around the ellipsoid body? 
And so to test this directly, Dan Turner Evans, or Dante for short, um, actually did the experiment. So he has um, PEN neurons with GCAMP6F in them and EPG neurons with JARGECO1A, as indicated by the colors. Um, this is a green indicator, that's a red indicator. So putting these two indicators simultaneously into this population and looking in the ellipsoid body, we can start asking, well, does one population lead the other? And of course, you want to switch the indicators to make sure it's not some indicator kinetics issue, which we did. And so what he saw then was indeed that if the fly was turning in one direction, the green population, the PEN population, led the EPG population around this ring. If the fly turned in the other direction, same thing. The green population led the EPG population. The green led the red here, uh, right around that ring. So really, it does seem like the circuit is configured in roughly this way, that the, you know, there's these two arms, the PEN populations dragging the EPG populations around. So this is something, of course, that requires, I mean, the final piece for us, uh, well, maybe not the final, but certainly an additional piece for us is establishing that these neurons are actually really connected to each other. Are there neurons like this inhibitory neuron that kind of propagates widely and provides uniform inhibition? What's, what's actually going on in the circuit? And so here we used a different EM approach that actually came a little bit before the earlier approach I showed you, the one, the collaboration with Google. In this case, it's TEM imaging led by a team from uh, Davi Bok at Genelia. And you can see the ellipsoid body here. It's nicely colored blue in EM. No, it's not I colored it, but it's, but it's kind of you know, obvious here even without the coloring that that's the bridge and that's the EM. And that's the ED, I'm sorry. So this is just a little video to walk through it. It's a little bit eye candy-ish, but you know, everyone else had Attenborough videos, I'm going with EM, so. <laughs> this is inner beauty, not superficial beauty. You know? <laughs> All right, so these blue things are the ring neurons. They come in, bring in visual input. The purple neurons you see here are the EPG neurons that carve up the ellipsoid body. The reddish neurons you see are the PEN neurons. And this green giant over there is the inhibitory neuron we call the delta-7. So we can actually trace out manually. I've traced some of these. It's addictive. It sounds unfun, but actually it's strangely fun. Uh, and you can get synaptic counts from every population to every other population, um, you know, down to single cell levels, single pair levels. And so that's kind of the place we're at with uh, this circuit. We, we're going down to that level of detail. There are a whole bunch of other cell types involved that I haven't talked to you about. Another type, we call this PN1, there's a PN2 that Gabby's lab discovered that we're also focusing on, and a whole bunch of other cell types. So it turns out the circuit is quite a bit more complicated, which I'm happy to get to in the workshop for those of you who are coming there. Um, but the bottom line is we think we have an opportunity here to get to something that's a pretty abstract representation. It holds for vision, it holds when there's no visual input and the fly is operating in darkness, it persists. We are intrigued by what all it could be used for. We think it's a representation that can be used flexibly, relatively flexibly. So we're, the, the key thing, though, is structure tells us a whole heck of a lot. It's literally like a theorist went in, kind of drew it up, and then the fly says, well, I've had you know, tons of time. I can get many generations of optimizing done, and so I'll just optimize the wiring until it looks like your diagram. So you know, it's, it's extremely helpful to have that structure-function relationship. And, the fact that you can extract this kind of insight by just looking at the structure is kind of powerful. Cell type specificity, the complete population, the connectome, I mean, basically, you know, if you're a theorist, surely you should be collaborating with a fly physiologist. Uh, and there's a few in the audience, so you know, find your favorite. So um, ultimately, though, we want to kind of link these representations to um, higher order behaviors. We want to link it back to the things I told you about, path integration, place learning, and so on. And so how do we go about doing that? I mean, one way we've been approaching this is to create a little virtual reality environment where we control everything. Um, this is a 2D environment. Um, Hannah Haberkern in the lab, who's a grad student and now for a short while will be a postdoc in the lab, has, has done really marvelous work um, that shows how a fly can kind of, in this environment, in a 2D world, a relatively simple 2D world with cylinders and cones, the fly kind of meanders around, fixates on something for a bit, explores a bit, goes off, does something else. But now we can kind of tweak this world. So we can make it so that um, the world has these objects, but every time it approaches one particular kind of object, so let's say the cone, we give it a little ping. We give it a reward, let's say, OK? So how do we give it the reward? Optogenetically, because that way we can control exactly when the reward happens, and there's no mess of like sugar leaking everywhere and getting on the fly's legs. So it gets a hit of sugar every time it gets near this cone. And then it kind of does its little wandering thing, gets a little blip there. That little blip is, is it getting a sugar hit. Wanders off. Nothing happens near this blue thing, which is actually the cylinder. 
um, you know, comes back around, gets another little hit, and so on. And so what we're trying to do with this is by reinforcing the fly's responses and its attraction to a particular, or sorry, not attraction, its approach to a particular landmark, we're trying to see, can we then take that to the same level of you know, physiology that we have? This is a physiology compatible rig that HANA has. And so what we want to see is, can we now drill down and see, well, how do you take a visual representation uh, with visual features and so on, bring it into a realm where now there's a reinforcer around does the fly learn visual scenes? Does it just associate actions with a particular scene? How does the heading representation configure in this? So this is stuff that we're still trying to work out, okay? Uh, at this point, I'm just gonna um, wrap up with a couple of different things. So um, this is the lab. I will particularly mention Johannes Selig, who is just this ridiculously gifted experimentalist and, and I'm more than just an experimentalist and leads his own group uh, in Bonn, so for those of you who are averse to coming to the US for a postdoc, I'd recommend Johannes's lab handily. He's uh, fantastic. Um, and actually, even if you like coming to the US, Johannes is fantastic, so you should go anyway. Uh, we collaborate closely with others at Genelia, so there are anatomy colleagues. So Tanya is this mir just miracle worker when it comes to figuring out things anatomically, and she really leads the way in terms of telling us what's what. Um, Saba has been leading the electron microscopy team. Um, we collaborate closely also with theorists at Genelia, so people like Hervé and Anne. And then beyond that, there's a little galaxy. Geneva is kind of an ecosystem where people work a lot together, and so we benefit from, you know, Gal Four lines from Jerry Rubin. The EM work I talked about was with Davi Bach. Michael Reiser is placed, uh, runs a lab with just, you know, amazingly cool tech. We always steal from him first, uh, anything we want. And so basically we get tons of advice. It's kind of a cool place to work. So this gets me to the last bit. I'm just gonna spend one minute on this. Um, Genelia is kind of undergoing a bit of a transition, okay? Some of you have heard about this. And we've gone from a broad focus in neural circuits and behavior to a more focused effort on cognition, okay? So we are refocusing, and part of this effort is tackling questions of the sort that maybe you heard several speakers here talk about. I mean, flexibility in behavior. So how flexible is it? How well can you disengage from, I don't know, the immediacy of the sensory present and just really explore um, you know, in, in mental space, make mental models as the environment is changing, mental models of others. So these are things that people don't traditionally think of um, as possible in flies, fish, and rodents, perhaps. But at least in rodents, we think this is, some of these complex things can be tackled with the right behaviors, as many of you do. I mean, mechanistic cognitive neuroscience is not new to Genelia. It's something many of you are exploring as well. But just as with neural circuits and behavior, where I think we were able to contribute quite a bit to the community, both technically and conceptually, the hope is to work you know, in complementary ways to those of you doing these interesting things there, to exchange ideas, to get your thoughts on what you think. You know, cognition is a tricky word. It's the kind of word that everyone gets irritated with when someone else uses it lightly. And I'm probably using it lightly for many of you. Certainly when I apply it to say building blocks of cognition in the fly, many of you are just like, ah, you know, this is just not on. Well, but we do think we can tackle at a very mechanistic level some things in the fly that deal with you know, making internal representations, simple internal models. And so our goal is to establish a program where people can come in, tackle really ambitious projects, develop sophisticated behavioral assays that engage mental processes of this sort. And if you are inclined to work on things like that, whether you're a theorist who thinks that you can unify you know, by looking at computations and models across these systems, unify things across the building, that's great. Um, or you're an experimentalist who's particularly daring and thinks, you know what, forget these animals, I think I have another idea, I can get mechanistic access in, I don't know, a corvid or an octopus, come talk to us. If you're a grad student, an early uh, postdoc, you know, particularly, we encourage people to start labs straight out of grad school. We think that foolishness that I had when I started was very helpful. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, if you have a gung-ho attitude, we'd love to hear from you. So please come visit. There's also junior scientist workshops for people doing theory, doing systems neuroscience. Keep an eye out for those. Anyway, we'd love to interact. Thanks. So I'll say quickly that if you have questions about the cognitive stuff, um, please catch me after the talk. For now, maybe questions about the fly work. Yeah. Okay, so time for questions. So if you're tracking your uh, orientation relative to a target, uh, as opposed to your orientation relative to the environment, as in rodents, then unless you're moving 
directly in the radial direction towards the target, you want ideally to update your presentation based on your linear motion. And yes. I wonder whether you have a hint on whether that happens. Yeah. And the second question, do you have any hints on representation of vertical orientations? Okay, so maybe I'll tackle the last one first. So uh, the idea that you have a toroidal representation of anything, I mean, you immediately go to, well, what does the other axis represent? Is it, you know, pitch? Is the pitch axis represented there? We don't yet know. We haven't done experiments of that sort. Um, it's slightly tricky to do technically, but you know, that's something where certainly the BAT folks have made us think about that a lot, like Nakum Ulanovsky and co. Um, in terms of linear motion, we have hints of things that capture forward velocity that seem to potentially even integrate over things like that in the same circuit. We also know in our 2D worlds that if there's a strong landmark there and you know, you're walking by it, um, the representation goes with the landmark. Um, but how does that then, how does the fly then keep track of where it is in 2D space? We think the forward and the, si and the angular things get integrated somewhere. We're still exploring that, don't yet know. Hi there, uh, really incredible talk, thank you. I'm very, thank very you. glad to see some invertebrate representation. Um, I was curious, when you're doing the optogenetic experiments in the uh, ellipsoid body, do you ever see behavioral effects of changing where this like, bump is and does the fly flip around and say, it's no, I was you'd never ask. <laughs> so there are a few different things we know. I mean, so firstly, I should just quickly say the central complex is way more complex than I drew it. There's a whole bunch of other structures here. But sticking to the ellipsoid body and Sung Su's experiments, so in this case, what we see, if I can find my thing, uh, when Sung Su moved the bump, every now and then, this is what he would see. So in this case, the fly has a stripe that it's, um, you know, the, the fly's wing beats are tethered to the movements of that stripe, or rather the movements of the stripe are tethered to its wing beats. And what you'll see is when Sung Su creates a new bump there, like that, there's a new bump, the fly sort of turns until its world aligns with its internal world, okay? So this is something we see from time to time. It's as if the heading of the fly can be guided, and I say can be with, with care because it's not that it's always guided by uh, the bump. And again, we think there are many visual motor pathways in the fly, so it's not always you know, going with what the central uh, complex pathway does. But in cases, we see this. And like I said, in experiments where we either snip the visual input or, and I didn't show you that, silence the compass neurons, what the fly seems to default to is going straight for a stripe. So it's as if like that's the default thing, but then we have these flexible things on top and the central complex provides one way of achieving that flexibility. Um, I'll also mention one quick thing just for fun. Uh, so if you look further down in regions called the lateral accessory lobe, which are several synapses down from the places I showed you, um, you see neurons like this one where if you stimulate optogenetically, this fly will show you a pirouette on demand. So mm -hmm. these are very different than the compass neurons. These are few synapses down. It's really like motor command things, like turn on the spot. So, yeah. Thank you for that talk. Uh, in the last session, I believe it was the last talk, they mentioned that some of these dynamics can change depending on the gain where you initially have a visual, a really visually uh, affected, basically lobe in in this ellipsoid body. In in this case, that's what it would be. But then, if the gain changes, it becomes more motion dependent. It, do you see anything of that sort in this? System? Yeah. If I can manage to pull this slide up, okay. So, um, so basically, we did do gain change experiments. So we tried, you know, really low gains and high gains and. Uh, what we could see is within a certain range, we'd get really high correlations with the visual landmark. So it was as if um, the visual thing mattered the most. But then as we started lowering the gains, and this is unpublished work, or switched them into non-biologically relevant regimes where it's like negative gains and so on, the fly will just ignore the visual stuff completely and go with its self-motion. So it trusts itself more than the world. <laughs> no. Thank you. Hi, so some theorists have been concerned with the robustness of the spontaneous bump, whether it would diffuse due to no noise or drift biasly due to asymmetries in the connections. Yeah. Are you guys thinking about that? Yeah, so one of the intriguing things we found with EM that I didn't have a chance to go into is that there are actually also dendrodendritic or dendroaxonic, call it what you will, connections within the ellipsoid body between the EPG and PN neurons. So there's just tons of recurrence, local and the loop-based things that we think actually stabilizes the bump quite well. And whether some of that is sub-threshold, non-spiking, we don't know. We're looking into that. But we think that confers a certain 
you know, strength of like prevents the bump from just diffusing off here and there. We don't yet know, we haven't tested this, but these are the ideas we are looking at. Uh, is there uncertainties oh, encoded sorry. in a person body, like the height and width of the bump? S say that again, I'm sorry. Un is, is there, there uncertainty encoded in, we haven't explored, I mean, Alex Pouget has always been clamoring for us to do experiments where we change the contrast subtly and ask if we have two cues of different contrast. I mean, there are people in my lab, Sang Soo Kim, who's um, kind of, some of you have probably heard speak. He's exploring those kinds of things a little bit more. So at some point, we will explore that. We haven't done it yet. Uh, and in natural environment, what's the reference or the zero, zero degree point of the... The, uh, the, the way that the reference gets set and the way that offsets are picked from the bump to the reference is, again, something that's not fully known. We think there's plasticity in the circuit that determines that. And we're kind of exploring that as well. So talk to me later if you want more. Uh, I guess I was having a question about the ellipsoid body and how generalizable is this in other subspecies of Drosophila um, and then also in just other insects as well. Sure. So thank you, Biafra, who, by the way, was the summer undergraduate who first set up that VR system that Hana later used. So um, just, just by way of introduction. But yeah, so um, to Biafra's question, so the ellipsoid body exists in other insects as well, but in a different way. So it's called the central body lower. It doesn't close all the way like it does in the fly. But again, the circuitry, I mean, we think is preserved, you know, in the locust or something like that. We haven't checked it with EM in these other systems, but that's happening too. I mean, people are doing that in, this, in the bee, for example. Um, so we'll find out. We, many elements of the circuit in terms of the columns and the layers in these structures are preserved. Um, you know, we haven't seen work yet that explicitly looks at the same population of neurons in a behaving animal, tracking the bump and things, but we expect it to be there. So maybe this is hard to study at Junelia where it's easy to get lost in the labyrinth, but I'm wondering uh, if there's any evidence that the bump is locked to world space as opposed to just being sure. some, some local Local thing, yeah. So in locusts, the strong evidence is that they lock to celestial cues, so polarized light E vectors and the position of the sun. Same thing with dung beetles. I mean, just gorgeous work from uh, Emily Baird and, and Marie Daka. And so there it looks like it is a global cue. In the fly, I mean, I'm almost certain that if you put a sun cue there, that would be a very dominant cue for the fly as well. So we don't yet know how global and local pay off, uh, play off against each other. We've done experiments in 2D environments with distal cues and local cues and it sometimes switches, and we don't know what behavioral state that corresponds to yet. So we're hoping that these experiments where we reinforce particular things with rewards and punishments will give us some more leverage on those issues. Sorry, before we take the next, the last question, can the next speaker come up? So given the behavioral evidence that you show that it seems like the, the activity bump actually can guide future behavior, um, to what extent do you see evidence that this is not just sort of a reflection or internal representation, but sort of uh, guiding this more complex activity that you're talking about. Do you see that reflected in the time course of the behavior relative to the activity no, pattern? No, so at the moment I'd say the evidence is at best weak. So okay. we see it and we want to kind of solidify it and part of the reason we're developing these what seem like more obscure tasks with rewards and such is there we really know what the goal of the animal is. So we hope to be able to use that to infer, you know, how strong is this activity coupled to the behavior and so on. Thank so, you. Yeah, sure. Thank you guys.